Okay, so let's uh, kind of go through the slides up to this point, and I'll uh, highlight the ones that um, I think are fairly important, which have a higher likelihood of making the exam. Um, so you might want to take notes on those, or uh, if you have any questions, you want me to re you know go over any of these things, I can do that now, and then we'll keep trucking with uh, the stuff for the uh, for the class. It's all paper based, right? All paper based. Yep. So sitting right where you're sitting right now. Uh, closed book, closed note. Uh, Ten questions. Half programming, half other. No true, false, or multiple choice. They'll all be like short answer, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't like the true, false, multiple choice stuff. They're, I think those are stupid. Um, let's see. Yeah, and you have the, the, the 50, 50 minutes or whatever to, to take it. I'll probably design it to take about 30 minutes for, you know, if you're where you should be in the class. So that should give you an idea of maybe the, um, the relative difficulty of the programming questions. They're not going to necessarily be, uh, um, they may be difficult for some of you, <laughs> but they're going to be designed to uh, um, show you about where you should be in the class. So for example, I might ask you to um, create a list and fill it with 10 numbers, that kind of stuff, or fill it with the numbers between uh, 1 and 100, um, jumping by 3, that kind of stuff, to make sure you understand the whole step function that we've used for going backwards and, and that stuff. When you do the range from a certain value to a certain value, then you tell it how you want it to walk. We've been using negative 1. Well, I might tell you to make it walk by 3, to jump by 3s or something like that. Um, maybe a function that takes in a, uh, a list of numbers and adds them all up, that kind of stuff. So more of utility, utility type, show me how you know how to do loops, show me that you uh, uh, know how to use variables, show me you know how to ask questions, that kind of stuff. Um, all right, so uh, now these first couple of slides are important. I don't know, I mean, if they'll, how they'll show up on the exam, but, you know, this whole idea of, you know, what's, a, what's programming, what's the purpose of a programming language to allow us to tell a computer what to do, how humans solve problems, that mapping, um, and how a programming language attempts to give us a power tool for telling a computer what to do without us having to change the way we already solve problems too much. All right, so there will likely be one question dealing with those slides right there. Something in that realm. Um, certainly understand, so there will probably be another question dealing with something along the lines of the difference between machine language, low level, high level, as it relates to the CPU. Um, I can see it that being a question. So understanding that the CPU is kind of this thing that has a whole bunch of magic tricks on it, and when we give it the correct sequence of magic tricks in a row for it to do, it something is actually accomplished. And the job of our high-level languages like Python is for us to be able to write stuff, stuff that is one line of code, for example, that translates into a whole bunch of those magic tricks under the hood so that we don't have to write all that tedious stuff. Um, I wouldn't show you, I remember when we went through this initially, remember I showed you like the hello world in Linux assembly, nothing like that will be on the uh, exam. Um, those are more uh, trivia type information, not necessarily unimportant, but really not content for this class. Um, all right, POSIX, not going to ask you about it. Um, you know, the idea, all these would kind of be fair game. Um, uh, all these different, the two kinds of programming languages, the three kind of programming languages, all those slides that talk about, you know, interpreted versus compiled, st compiled strongly typed versus loosely typed. So most interpreted languages happen to be loosely typed languages, which means they're relatively slow. Not sure what format that question or if that question will exist, but those are things that I put higher up on a pedestal. Just that understanding the different, the different nature of different programming languages to ultimately kind of come to that conclusion that all languages ultimately are the same. We just have to pigeonhole them into, you know, which slight little variation 
Um, <laughs> there is. Yeah, I guess think about it like uh, Coke versus Pepsi. You know, they're both colas, but uh, they have their distinctive uh, flavor. And, you know, some people won't touch one. Some people, you know, that kind of stuff. Anybody in here like that? Where you go to a restaurant and you'll say, I'll have a Coke. And they say, we have Pepsi products. And you say, okay, I'll just have water. Mm-hmm. Like, you're that at that extreme, really. It, 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 do you, like, you, will you not drink the other one? Or you're just not willing to pay for the other one? I won't drink the other one. Really? I don't like Pepsi. Hmm, Interesting. I'm not, I, I've drank uh, diet soda for so long, I'm not even sure which of the two regular ones I would... I like Coke Zero out of diet sodas, but that's a whole different ball game, right? Coke is better than regular Pepsi. So what's this? Regular Coke tends to be better than regular Pepsi. And regular you Pepsi think the other way or the same? You think the yeah, same. You can't taste anything over the sheer amount of sugar in a regular Pepsi. Mm. Yeah, because I've met people before that'll say... Uh, they'll drink either, but they'll pay for one of them. You know, like, okay, I'll give you three bucks for all you know, all you can drink Coke. But I'm not giving you anything, right? <laughs> you can drink Pepsi. You hand me a free can of Pepsi, I'll drink it. <laughs> now, which, I mean, yeah, you would maybe do that. Free Pepsi, I'm okay. probably going to drink it. I gotcha. But if there's another option, I'm probably going to option. <laughs> like stagnant water out of a pond? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so probably one question I would uh, think, maybe two, dealing with the, the whole different types of languages. All right, um, that's something we spent quite a bit of time talking about. It's something that I think is pretty important. Um, not so much, well, definitely for us in here, but also for your career as a software developer, it's understanding the tool you're working with and kind of the nature of it is kind of important. You know, uh, if we want to draw a parallel, um, if any of you are, um, you know, doing lawn maintenance or something like that in the uh, in the summer and you have a, a gas-powered uh, weed eater versus an electric weed eater, you know, because of the electric is more convenient, right? You just turn it on, good to go, but you kind of know that you're dealing with a, like a less horsepower, you can't go and get the really high weeds, that kind of stuff. So the nature of the tool changes the way you might problem solve with it, right? Even though it's a perfectly acceptable tool, you also need to pick your battles because you're going to run out of battery life relatively quickly with, with those guys. And so you got to get the high weeds quick or <laughs> you can do those early. Um, or what I do is I usually just tell my neighbor to, like, see, hey, my back's hurting, so I'll make my neighbor go and do it. Um, or pay a student, one of the two. <laughs> both, of those, huh? yeah, both those things have actually happened. No, I'm down to yeah. all day. <laughs> all, all, all day. Don't hire an amateur like that. <laughs> I come from a family of music, <laughs> so you know that you're getting the best. You, you have, I have my own pair of shears that I take out. And those little pieces of grass that just get cut off, just not quite at the right angle. I take care of that. Yeah, I, I believe it. So, uh, <laughs> my wife actually, is, my wife is l- little, so uh, um, she, you know, she can't really, like, carry, like, well, I mean, she could for a very short period of time, but, like, a, um, a weed eater or something. So, like, when she's had weeds around her flowers and stuff, she goes out there with scissors, just cuts them, cuts them down. And one time I got in a lot of trouble when I was backing my boat back into the driveway, and she just planted all of her new... I got a little bit off of, and uh, yeah, so, yeah. You stayed in that night. Well, the, the thing is, I then I went. Apparently, I said the wrong thing because uh, she had been complaining recently that they they were, were kind of not perking up real well in the sun or whatever. So I came in. I said, I got good news for you. You don't have to water your plants anymore. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I realized that very quickly when she came outside and started crying. <laughs> it was very clear that, that she took the plant significantly more seriously than I did. But lucky, luckily, they bounced back. Those are quite resilient plants. Um, I don't know. They're like purpley. You see them all over the place during the, the summer. Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't think it's like a rare... 
I'll tell you what they they're they're six bucks from uh, <laughs> from uh, who sells those things. Yeah, what's the name of the place? Steins. Six bucks from Steins. That's what they are. Every year we have to go and buy these stupid plants. No wonder I backed over them with my boat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So, <laughs> uh, same thing. Compiled versus interpreted languages. Um, you know, the could ask a question like, what's the job of a compiler? Translate a high-level language to a low-level language. That would be a, a fair game type thing. Um, as a general rule, this is just kind of popping into my head right now, I will probably ask questions that are geared more towards that, that the Python kind of ecosystem, if you will. So Python being an interpreted, high-level, loosely typed language. There's a decent chance I'll frame questions kind of angled towards that understanding um because I, I guess i don't want you to uh even though it's a next semester when we're doing java stuff which is gonna which is a, a strongly typed um compiled language we'll kind of get the other side of it uh, and you'll see those little nuances the little bit different uh the difference between the battery powered weed whacker and the gas powered weed whacker that that kind of thing where the languages are very similar but there's little nuances there that you do have to take into consideration so more than likely when I'm writing the exam, I'll probably try to twist my qu questions more towards that Python side because one thing I am really trying to, to gauge is um, the effort you've been putting into your homework and uh, what you've been getting out of the homework. Um, so given that your homework recently has all been Python, I kind of don't want to throw you a curveball and have you start answering questions that you do understand in the Python world, but you just kind of misexplained it in more like the high level compiled world or something like that. So expect questions to be more angled towards loosely typed interpreted um, languages. So with that said, if I asked a question about compilers, I would ask that very specific question. What is a compiler? You know, it's a, it's a tool that converts a high-level language into a low-level language. I wouldn't ask uh, something more specific. In fact, even as I'm saying that, I think it's probably not real likely I'll ask that question, the compiler -like question, since we're dealing specifically with an interpreted language. Um, two kinds of programming languages, domain-specific versus general purpose. Probably wouldn't. I mean, it's important to understand when you're working with a language that has a very specific purpose. Probably the example I used in class has something to do with like the programming language like dishwashers you use or something like that when the repair person comes out versus general purpose, which is what Python is built to solve all sorts of problems. Um, but I don't know, it would be hard to come up with a question in that specific vein, I guess. So I probably wouldn't ask anything about uh, that specifically. Um, definitely nothing about functional. Procedural versus object-oriented would be fair game, but uh, the thought that just popped in my head when I thought about it is we're, we're just kind of on the cusp. We're going to start looking at objects in Python, and this is probably a question that would uh, be completely fair game on the final. Um, when you really have had the experience of working with objects versus non-objects. Non if you remember, we had the conversation when I first introduced this about the telephone, right? You know, the pile of wires versus the thing that actually looks like the telephone. So conceptually, it wouldn't be that difficult of a question, but I really want you to feel working with objects versus non-objects to, you know, so that this question kind of has a, a, a place. So I probably wouldn't ask something about this slide on this test, but it is really important. Just timing is off for it. Loosely typed versus strongly typed, this one would be a fair game type thing since we are dealing with a loosely typed language and even as recently as last class when we're talking about scoping rules where we don't define variables in uh, um, you know we don't define variables in uh, Python so they just kind of get invented out of nowhere and we did see that in Python 3 if we hadn't previously defined the variable we do get an error which is new uh, for an interpreted language. So, because interpreted languages kind of just fly by the seat of their pants as they're being interpreted during runtime. So the fact that it noticed that we hadn't defined the variable is somewhat impressive. Probably means that under the hood, they're doing some optimization to make it run even 
faster, kind of more like a compiled language, more than likely. Um, but that understanding that a loosely typed language indicates that the language in the big scheme of things is going to be relatively slow. It means we don't define the kind of value that a variable is built to hold, which means that we have something like a type inference engine during runtime when, when we go to do math or something with a variable, there's going to be a little bit of a delay because they have to, the, 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 the Python interpreter has to peek inside of the variable and see what kind of animal lives in there before it determines what if what you're trying to do makes sense. That makes sense? All right, so um, certainly that idea of loosely type, and this would be another good example of if I were to ask a question, I likely wouldn't ask the, the direct question of what's the difference between loosely typed and strongly typed. I would probably ask something more about loosely typed specifically as it relates to Python. I might give you a, an example um, and ask you what happens with this line of code. So, um, you know, I could, you know, we've, we've worked with uh, the plus operator where sometimes it does math, sometimes it does concatenation. So it would be fair for me to give you a, uh, um, a line of code or a small function or something and say, and say what does this do? Um, that maybe asks you to really consider the kinds of values that are stored in there that we're applying that plus operator to as opposed to what it might look like at a glance. Same thing would be true for Boolean expressions, which we're, we're going to come up on here in a, a couple of slides, I assume. But uh, um, similar there, where I might give you a Boolean expression, I might say, what's the output of this? You know, it would be certainly be fair game for me to ask, you know, what is a Boolean expression and for you to come up with that whole, any expression that boils down to a single value of true or false, something like that. Um, but from a practical perspective, it might make more sense for me to give you a couple of variables with values and they can give you a Boolean expression that probably has some ands and ors in it or something and tell you to tell me what the answer to that guy is. Is it a true or is it a false, proving that you kind of understand how those things kind of string together and ultimately, regardless of how complex they may have looked at the beginning, ultimately come out to a, a single value of true or false? Um, history of languages, definitely very important in terms of that when you when you sit down and you're using a piece of technology, especially when you are out in the workforce or doing an internship, um, uh, when you're given a piece of technology to kind of pigeonhole it and figure out which what realm does that guy live in and kind of get wrap your mind around is this what kind of language is it and, and what's it what was it originally built for for you know what purpose uh, uh, was it kind of geared towards. I don't know if I would ask a question specifically about this, or at least not directly. Um, I certainly wouldn't like give you like a chart with like a couple of these missing and say fill in the blanks or something like that, something like that. That that's not my style. So um, I think it's important that you understand this, but I would say you don't need to memorize this for the uh, for the exam. Uh, you should probably have an idea that Python fits over here in that web language side of things and all of these language ten, languages tend to be loosely typed, general purpose, interpreted languages. All right, um, so that's more about knowing what Python is and where it maybe fits in the world. But since we don't really have context for the rest of this stuff in terms of practical context, I can't see asking a question specifically about this slide. Make sense? Um, similarly, when we get into uh, some of these guys, this fits in that exact same vein. How we got to a language like Python is important. And if I needed a, 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 a throwaway question or something like that, if it was one question short or something, I might pull something that we really kind of drilled lots of times out of one of these slides. Um, but I probably wouldn't ask anything about, uh, um, you know, the evolution of these guys. Notice here that, you know, arrays are there way back in C. We just started talking about arrays in Python called lists, right? So, uh, those things ex have existed for a while. Um, 
Yeah, nothing jumps out there. The concept of a pointer would have a, if I needed a throwaway type question, that would be more of something that might end up in the exam. That idea that um, variables actually point to a place in memory. All right, so uh, um, understanding that the value lives in memory, a variable points to that place in memory where the value actually lives. Probably a low chance I'd ask that question like that, but if you're picking from these low priority slides, the idea of how memory relates to our variables is of higher priority than picking some little detail out of one of these other slides. Uh, there will almost definitely be a, at least one conversion question on there. I love conversion questions. Um, I could even see there being two. In fact, if I need a throwaway question, there's a significantly higher chance I would throw another conversion question in there than a question about pointers. I really like conversion questions. Because it just never ceases to, it's one of those things that I, I, I keep harping on for semester after semester. And we, we drill it in class and then half the class still misses them. And they should be like three points. So with that said, make sure you have a, a calculator of some type. You can use the, the calculator on your phone or borrow one from your neighbor, come up and use mine. That's fine. Just in case I give you a, a, a number that's somewhat big. I try to take that into consideration when I'm giving you the, the number to convert, convert that it's not some, you know, crazy, you know, gigantic number that, that, you know, multiplication takes you 15 minutes to, to, to double check your answer. So I... I try to take that into consideration. But definitely the conversion guys. Um, but maybe as an example related to the complexity of the programming questions, I would ask you to convert a number by hand. Um, but I wouldn't ask you to write a, a, a function, even though those functions weren't all that complex for a homework assignment, I wouldn't ask you to solve a problem of, of that level of complexity for writing a program that does something like that of that similar complexity because there's a lot of moving parts with that, right? And that takes some time to sit there and work through and draw your pictures and that kind of stuff. And that's not really the goal of an exam. You know, the goal of, of an exam isn't to show how badly can you embarrass yourself in a, you know, in a fixed amount of time. You know, when you didn't have your four hours to work on your homework assignment, instead you had eight minutes to do that question. <laughs> All right, so um, I try to consider that as well. <coughs> you see how much I like conversion questions? Um, I could also see, um, if I did two conversion questions, I could see a conversion from uh, one base to another base and then a conversion for memory sizes. Remember we had that day where we talked about like internet connection speeds and, and that kind of stuff. So I could see a question um, like saying if you have a 50 megabit per second internet connection, what's the um, uh, maximum download speed in gigabytes per second or something like that. Having you do that conversion on this chart. So megabit per second would, is over here on the left side. That's little b. So you'd have to divide it by eight to get over to this side and then divide it by 1,024 to get it to gigabytes. Okay, so 50 megabit divided by eight is 6.25 megabyte divided by 1,024 or 1,024 is 0 0.006 gigabytes per second. All right, so being able to move up and down this chart because data sizes, even though I've applied it to an internet connection, because that's something we all kind of know something about, right? You know, we see that internet connections are sold to us based on a, you know, a speed that we're buying. Um, even though it never ceases to amaze me how, uh, how often technology students have no idea the speed of their internet at home. I mean, like, you should know that maybe better than, like, your phone number, because you don't need a phone number. You just you know, don't you just send your, your friend your contact? You don't have to write your internet connections to get on job applications. Say this again? You don't have to write your internet connections Yet. To get on job applications. Yet. <laughs> As jobs, you know, hold on. 
we joke, but more and more jobs, especially in technology, this is actually very appropriate for technology people because um, this is how people are getting significantly higher salaries than they typically would in the Midwest because more jobs are becoming remote jobs. Mm -hmm. So if you want a trick, might not work so well for internships because a lot of times they want you in person. Uh, and by the way, I'll be posting another internship for Northwestern Mutual on Slack later on today. Uh, one of our former students is working there and they have an internship that's going up. But uh, what's not uncommon is for folks to apply to a lot of times startup companies that are in like New York and uh, Los Angeles or, or Silicon Valley, San Francisco area, um, where the pay scale, so you know, New York probably starting salary right out of school for a computer, if somebody with a computer science degree is, let's say a hundred, something like that, maybe 90,000 a year. Same thing on uh, West Coast. Well, that's not mean, that doesn't mean you're making more money. It's, it's the cost of living is really expensive out in the coasts. Well, now, let's say a company that was going to have to pay somebody local 100000 can pay you 85000 or even 75000 right out of school. And you're sitting here in your apartment in Milwaukee where your starting salary here in Milwaukee might be sixty right out of school or 65 right out of school. So you're making $10,000 more and you don't have to put pants on for work. <coughs> All because, you know, our, our society is now starting to accept this idea of remote, the remote workforce, especially in computer programming and, and that kind of stuff. How would you interview? Well, you probably want to put pants on for the interview. <laughs> I would start with that and you want to lead with what's my internet speed. Right, <laughs> that's where I kind of came from. Is uh, a lot of times when you deal with your remote jobs, they want to know what your internet connection uh, quality is, not just speed, but you know what type of uh, connection you're on, so they know whether or not it's going to be standard, you know, like acceptable for video chats and and remoting into their machines and and that kind of stuff. But I mean, uh, I. They're posted all over the place. I mean, a good site that I like to go to um, if you're looking for a remote job like that is a, there's a job site called whitetruffle.com. Whitetruffle.com because you can actually put in like the cities you're interested in. It, it's specifically tech jobs. And you can put in that you're looking for remote only. So it kind of lets you bore into the, you know, the 15 or 20% of the jobs that would accept a remote only employee. That kind of thing. So I know you joke, but eventually knowing what your internet connection speed is, is is going to be, you know, important. A lot of those companies save their money by having people remote interviews because then they don't pay for your internet. Yep, they don't pay for your internet. They don't have to pay for your parking. Um, uh, they don't have to pay for your health insurance a lot of times um, because that's one of the, the depending on the perk. So sometimes they'll, uh, uh, if you're out of state, this might change. Uh, with the uh, Trump uh, administration because he's talking about uh, insurance over state lines. But a lot of times if you are an out-of-state employee, if you live, you don't live in the state, they don't have to uh, provide insurance or if you pay or if you work less than so many hours per week, they have more flexibility if they don't have to force you to walk into the office. That could be part of the negotiation. A lot of times they'll hire you as an independent contractor <coughs> with a, you know, a, a long-term contract. So you're not actually a W-2 employee. You're a you know, infinite independent contract, <laughs> something like that, which there's lots of gray areas with that Disneyland stuff. That. Say this again? Disneyland does that? That doesn't surprise me, yeah. But they can get away with it because a lot of their stuff is seasonal. They have a lot of seasonal employees um, because they're bringing people in from a lot of different places in the world. Um, and I'm sure they have their core staff, which they wouldn't be able to pull that off for, from. But when you have, you know, college students who go and work their summer at Disney World, that's independent contractor all day long. You know, your biggest perk is free admittance into Disney. I got engaged at Disney. I have a live, uh, live picture of, of me. This was right after I'd broken my back. Mm -hmm. I know I was, uh, and uh, so I have a live picture right in front of Cinderella's castle. My grandpa took it. Of me getting down on a knee, I couldn't, I couldn't get back up because <laughs> I was stressed out that day, you know, because some of the back spasms were so bad. <laughs> it was terrible. Yeah, so I have a live picture of that. I didn't look that great. <laughs> I had this whole back brace on everything.
Very romantic. Um, okay, uh, I wouldn't ask anything about a T1 connection if you remember that conversation was, that's referenced in a lot of movies is like what the, you know, like, oh my gosh, a T1 connection would be awesome. And even today they're very expensive, but it's a slow internet speed by, by our uh, um, standards. This special syntax thing was our discussion about pointers. I probably wouldn't ask anything about this. This was kind of a flashback to a language like C, which has a special syntax for whether or not you want the memory address where a value lives versus the value at a memory address. In our more modern languages, a lot of times that's taken care of for us. Um, specifically, a language like Java literally has taken away the, the ability to get to pointers. Python has a function that allows you to say, give me the memory address there. We haven't looked at it, but it does exist. You don't have to worry about it right now. Um, same category as the other ones. Important stuff probably won't make the exam. The idea of pass by value versus pass by address, understanding it is uh, pretty important. This might fall into the category of a timing thing again. Um, we just introduced lists and lists will become, they are passed by address and we'll see that. But we're probably not going to see it till the week when we come back from break. So, uh, or possibly later on uh, this uh, this week, maybe on uh, what well, we have our exam next class, and then we'll go over the exam on Friday, and then I'll probably start talking. I was going to start talking about sorting today. We we will probably get into it a little bit, but my guess is that this concept will be something left for the final because we haven't seen it in practice yet. We talked about it. We talked about the idea, like if you. I give you the address to my house, you go there with a can of spray paint, I'll notice when I get home. Because you change the actual place, there is side effect, but once we see it in the context of programming, then I'll probably ask the question. Um, virtual mean, machine stuff, um, won't be on there. Same thing. Same thing, this is all important stuff, but because it's uh, a little bit off our, um, what we've been focused on more recently, uh, probably won't ask anything about it. I potentially could ask a question with that whole client side versus server side thing. I, again, if I needed to find a throwaway type question, like a, an extra question, a filler that maybe wasn't a programming question, because programming questions, I'm already going to decide that these are going to take more time. So I need one of those questions. It's like this should be like a one or two minute question. Um, something like this I would put higher up on that scale of lower priority stuff that I might think is a little bit more important. The idea that, you know, we have server side back end stuff, things that are happening over here on the web server, client side front end stuff, things that are happening on the web browser. Python is something that lives over here on the web server stuff. Where, this, where there's a little pushback for me on this is because we haven't used Python in, in the web sense at this point where the output of our code is an HTML document, um, it might be hard for me to formulate a question that is kind of in the vein of what we've been doing. But this, so I would say this likely won't be on the exam, but in the range of lower priority stuff, this would be higher priority than like the evolution of Java type stuff. Go ahead. Are we going to do uh, website type stuff uh, later on? Um, maybe. It really depends on how quickly we progress and um, because, you know, I speed or slow the class up for, for multiple reasons. Depending on how people are doing in homework, mm -hmm. I can slow this class down or speed it up because I know I'm going to have you again in 250. So we're, we pick up where we left off. In, in 250 so it's there's some flexibility there we just need to make sure we get our core competencies in here but um, if you don't get it in here there'll be other opportunities for us to do that stuff uh, we'll certainly uh, you know we're going to be doing the hackathons uh, every semester so things like this would be fair game for the hackathon and um, it's not really difficult okay. stuff so that could be something we maybe do a workshop maybe maybe even you know, a couple of uh, Grace folks are in here, so maybe uh, um, maybe even like a, a, a Grace meeting night or something like that where we do a, uh, um, you know, like a, a web programmer programming demo type thing or, you know, boot camp. 
that could be that. Huh? Yep, that's in here tonight at the robots. Yep, five o'clock with donuts. There'll be donuts. Hour, hour and a half with bleed over. I have a class in here at six, but I, class starts when I decide it starts. <laughs> so, so if I'm having fun playing with robots, my my grad students just have to wait. <laughs> a lot of them are. <laughs> um, that's right. Well, it's a nice presentation for them. That's a computer science research class. Hmm. Yeah, one of the students is giving a presentation on something kind of fascinating. It's um, uh, this week the the grand idea of computer science we're dealing with is automation, and they're doing a. Um, you might even, if you're interested, you could stay and listen to it. It's on a uh, drone-based ambulance. So, because normal ambulances can't necessarily get out to you know an area as quick, uh, hospitals can actually place. Um, you know, kind of drone hotspots around cities, uh, not having to worry about traffic and stuff like that, and dispatch a drone to like, you know, let's say somebody's having a heart attack or something like that, and the drone gets to the place first. Normal ambulance with real people is still en route, all right? But the drone gets there first, and there you can have a video chat with a doctor, and the drone on board has like defibrillators and stuff like that, which will talk a person through potentially saving somebody's life while the actual professionals are who know what they're doing or on their way. So it's kind of an interesting, well, but you at least have a better chance than sitting there and waiting 25 minutes for an ambulance to get through traffic. When the drone gets shot down, like, you know, because the person thought it was an Amazon drone. <laughs> that's right. You might, you're going to have anti-drone uh, weaponry. That's, that's, that's true. Gonna be, that's going to be like a regular thing soon. Well, now we're going to have drones with anti-anti-drone weaponry. Drone wars. Drone wars, that's right. It'll be like that bot wars. Now the question is, what happens first? That or asking for your internet speed in your job applications? Depends on the time. I'm just saying. Now, as, a, as a computer science major, you should know what your internet, internet speed is. It's like a requirement. Will that be on the line? If you know your ping, that's, I mean, that should be a requirement as well. But then that just tells me that you're probably not spending your time in your homework, you're spending your time gaming. <laughs> if you know your ping, not your total bandwidth, you're a gamer. <laughs> All right. Um, same thing with API stuff. Higher on the list than like evolution of Java, but we don't really have a context for it, for what we've been doing in here, so I probably wouldn't ask it. I don't want to get you to, I mean, as you're studying for this, I would focus in on the Python stuff. In fact, I'd probably say I won't ask a question about this. I realistically won't ask a question about this. Really focus in on things that are in that vein of loosely typed programming languages, Python, you know, the stuff that's related to that directly are the things that I'm going to focus on in the exam. So this is all important stuff, all good stuff gives us an idea of where Python lives in that ecosystem, but it's not something we've worked with practically in here for Python, so I probably don't want to pull you too far away from what you've been actually focusing on in the semester to have you retain some random information, even if it's important in the big scheme of things, maybe not important for you to show me what you've learned right now. Um, same thing here. I can see design pattern stuff maybe popping up on the final because we're we're going to run into some stuff with MVC and things like that um, and singletons before the uh, um, before the end of the semester. So that's probably going to be a final exam thing. Um, certainly, variable stuff will be on the exam. Understanding that variables are our uh, extension of of memory. You know how how do human beings solve problems? We use memory, asking questions, repetition. All programming languages have mappings for these things, variables for memory, conditionals or like if statements for uh, asking questions, loops and uh, functions for repetition. Um, so this is very much appropriate, uh, uh, appropriate stuff. This whole idea of name value pair, um, being able to define a variable and then print it 
That could be a, uh, a simple a simple question. Uh, me maybe showing you three or four lines of code that have some variables and asking you to uh, tell me what the output of this program is. Uh, I can certainly see having a small function that does something, like I write the function, and then having a couple of lines of code that define some variables and then call that function, and you telling me what the output will be, kind of proving that you understand how values are passed as parameters to functions. All right, so things that are more complex like that, um, well, I say like that, I might write a more complex function for you to read on the exam. I wouldn't ask you to write that in the exam, but you should be able to trace through code. Nothing like, I'm not purposely gonna be trying to trick you with some like loop inside of a loop inside of a loop that like fakes you out, okay? But I would ask you to be able to trace through some code and tell me what the ultimate output is because that's a skill set you should have, even if I wouldn't expect you to write that function in the time period for the exam. Make sense? So I would expect at least one or two questions like that where I give you some code in the similar level of complexity to like the, the uh, conversion, you know, binary to, to, deci to decimal, those types of things, where there's a loop and you got a couple of variables that are changing, you know, getting you to show me that you can keep track of what's happening as the loop is going and, and that kind of stuff. If you read it, not necessarily write it, because most of you are going to have a stronger skill set in reading code right now than you will in writing it yourself. Go ahead. So, so you're what you're saying is like you'll show us like a little bit of code you say what is the what is, what is the output of this program? Yep. Yeah, there'll probably be one or two of those. Because that lets me see your competence without stressing your time. You know, because I would maybe expect I might give you something that I would expect you to be, be able to pull off in a you know, you have two days to work on this homework assignment, but not in this is a ten minutes of your fifty minute exam time slot rather have you spend that showing me what you are able to do in a short period of time just showing me the fundamentals and maybe that's a good way of thinking about the uh, what to expect for the programming questions on the exam I'm looking for you to show me that you've gained some competency in those fundamentals defining variables using those variables um, asking a question, you know, so formulating Boolean expressions, not super complex ones, but that you have a, you have a competency in writing some, some simple if statements, writing loops that go through some number of times and do something. What you will likely be doing through the loop each time will probably be something very simple because we don't have a lot of time on the exam. So I want you to show me that you have a, a grasp on those fundamentals and you can write those things off the top of your head with mostly... Um, no errors. You know, I'm, I'm not going to be super nitpicky. So, you know, you forget a, a colon or something in the end of the line, something that the, the Python interpreter would certainly scream at you about. Um, you know, I, I may miss it or I might circle it, but I probably wouldn't take off points. So if you can show me general competence in an answer to the, the programming questions, I'm not going to nitpick on something stupid that you would have been able to fix after trying to run it once. Okay, that's not the point of what I'm trying to test. All right, so certainly variable stuff, very important. Uh, that concept of um, uh, integer division versus uh, um, decimal division, the slash for floating point division versus two slashes for integer division, and then also modulus. So, you know, uh, if I did ask you a, a question, to maybe you know, loop through all the numbers between one and 100 and print out all the powers of three or something like that, you should be able to ask that question. If I mod three is equal to zero, then print it out. Okay, so understand those concepts. These, these come into play in lots and lots and lots of different problems in programming. So this modulus thing, I always refer to it as third grade math. Third grade math is a really, really important uh, thing that we use in programming all the time. This is when you had long division, probably in third grade. Something like that, I'm thinking, is when long division was introduced. So, you know, it's something that we didn't like back then. We probably still don't like it today. <laughs> but but uh, it's it's pretty important to all sorts of, like, security algorithms and, and that kind of stuff. Go ahead. So, A mod 2 prints out the remainder slash last. Does that print out? Um, okay, could you, like, just... Refresh me on slash. The difference between slash and slash. So slash slash gives you the truncated division. Yeah. 
So five slash slash two gives you two. Five slash two gives you 2.5. Make sense? Yeah. So one slash does not truncate gives you the actual correct math answer. Slash slash is what I would call integer division. It, tr but what it's really doing is, is just truncating. Any, it'll be two point whatever. Doesn't matter if it's two point nine or two point one. It's two. It cuts it off. It doesn't. It's not doing rounding. So truncation is is chop off everything after the decimal point. Don't round. So this gives the the percent gives you the remainder of an integer division. Slash gives you the floating point. This is the actual math answer. Floating point answer. 5 divided by 2 with a single slash is 2.5. Slash slash says, I want you to do this as integer division. Truncate the result. Decimal points are not allowed. Make sense? Okay. Um, so there's that whole human solve problem stuff. Wait, what, what, the percent, what is it called again? Modulus. Modulus. Yep. And so 5 modulus 2 is the... One. One. Yep, the remainder of five divided by two. Two goes into five, two whole times with one left over. Because yep. two times two is four, takes one more to get to five. And that's what we were doing with... Uh, A lot of stuff. Yeah, the, all the conversion with, stuff. With the one conversion, yeah. Yep. Same way as one conversion. So when we're doing that, we have to... Because your example, you had 21, you had to buy, you just use regular division, but... Well, know, yeah, because we were doing it as people. Yeah, we weren't. Yeah, I mean, this is Python. All right. Yeah, that's that slash slash and the percent stuff. That's Python so syntax. When I, so when you say do convert bit divide twenty one from base ten to base two, we would look at the way that you had is twenty one percent. Correct. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. yeah. What you're gonna say? Twenty one divided by two should give me this number. That's the slash slash. Okay. And then 21 mod 2 gives me the remainder out here. Yep. You know, that if you want to think about it in Python terms. But really, you're doing the third grade long division. Mm -hmm. you know, here's the whole number version. Here's the remainder. Okay. So again, the whole be able to do variables, if statements, repetition, loops, that kind of crap. Um, the idea of a type inference engine, we talked about that already, you know, knowing that we have to check to see what kind of value lives in a variable before we can use it with certain operators. Um, I might ask you something about what's the purpose of a type inference engine, and you would answer something pretty similar to what I just said. You know, it's the guy that checks the kind of value, the type of value that lives in a variable to determine whether something is allowed. Um, but at the very least, you should understand that concept that an extra layer of checking has to happen. What Boolean expressions are, we already talked about those. The arithmetic operators, less than, less than or equal to, all those guys. Um, the uh, logical operators, we saw that uh, in Python 3, this is and and the word or, they're spelled out. Um, all our literal values, so chars, strings, uh, numbers, these are just normal stuff, the stuff you'd put inside of variables. String find might be something you should uh, have to do or be capable of working with. String concatenation, definitely. Um, these two conversion tools, I, this would be something I might put in one of those questions. I ask you to read the codes, uh, converting a, uh, an int to a string and a, uh, some value into an int. And then writing functions, which is our more recent thing we've been working on. All right, so programming questions will likely come in the form of write a function that does something for a couple of them and then write a loop that does something for a couple other ones. All right. Okay. I will see everybody on Wednesday.